Morina. Um, I've, I've, been, I've been practicing at the table for a wee while, so um, it's my great pleasure to be here. I think I'm about to talk myself out of a job because um, I've found so much expertise and enthusiasm and, I guess, understanding of what needs to happen already in my few days around New Zealand, well, Wellington and Auckland, uh, that I don't know if you really need someone like me from miles away to tell you how to do this or why to do this or why it's important um, because I think I get the sense you know that already. So, so I'm not being too humble, I hope. I think the, the, the reason why I am here is that we have simply done this for a while. We've taken this approach over a whole country and we've not got it all worked out but uh, we've, uh, we've learnt some lessons which we can share with you. Um, we've done some things wrong and uh, learn from that as well. Um, and I guess my, my job and my colleague Jonathan, who, who would be here but can't be, um, is, uh, is to share those with you and help things along. So an expert, Mark Twain described an expert as some guy from out of town. So I'm the, I'm the guy from out of town. And the sweeties are Moffat toffees, in case you thought they were um, just uh, for, for decoration. You can eat them, they're an acquired taste, they take a bit of soaking, but uh, feel free to go on and have them. So, um, I think it's traditional to say where you're from. I'm from way up there. Uh, we're now a long way away. I only arrived on Saturday. If I talk gibberish, it's because I'm still a bit jet lagged. Um, but Scotland is a long way, but there's, as, as I've said, I want to maybe assure you or reassure you why, why you can learn lessons from Scotland because there are, we have a lot of things in common. Um, <laughs> rugby. I would have to concede that you're probably better at it than we are, although we took great pride this year in beating our neighbour, and I think you beat your neighbour several times this year, haven't you? So, um, so. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm, I'm open to any perspective. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so yeah, and we share wonderful landscapes, uh, quite similar, aren't they? This is Wester Ross, where my colleague uh, lives. Uh, I live in a different part of Scotland. Look quite similar. I guess that, that, the issues of rurality. I mean, very similar population. We've got slightly more people. We're just about as spread out as you are, maybe not quite. We have some very rural parts of Scotland, so some of the same issues around managing change and trying to improve things for cities as well as for uh, very, very rural parts of the country. So, and it's, it's a, they're nice places to live, aren't they? So, um, so rurality brings sheep. I've, I, couldn't, I couldn't not mention sheep, obviously. So. so, and again, apologies for some people who've maybe seen me talk about this before. I think it's worth re remembering you know, the power of, the, of what we're describing here. Now, this is not a Scot or a New Zealander. This is Ayrton Senna, uh, who's the Grand Prix driver who died. And of course, that weekend when he died, there's another Grand Prix driver also killed. Now, I guess what I'm, trying, what I'm going to talk about is the fact that there was an assumption that young men driving fast cars at 200 miles an hour around a circuit, once in a while, you're going to have some utter disaster, some will die. You know, it, it happened over the, over the decades of motorsport. But, and, it's, and it, this is where it links to what you're doing. People decided, that, wait a minute, you know, this, this, this outcome, this, these deaths shouldn't be happening. You know, these seclusions that happen, some places more than others, shouldn't be happening. So it took a massive cultural change and lots of different things that then happened, but from that point, from that weekend, until a single, a single death just a couple of years ago in Japan of a, of a Grand Prix driver, which was a different kind of situation, you might see a, a sort of an aberration, really. The, something that had been culturally accepted, you know, i.e. deaths occur in motor racing, seclusion occurs in mental health settings, became unacceptable and led to change. So massive change on the basis of, of a cultural shift is what that demonstrates. And, I, and it's what I think you may well demonstrate. Can you imagine standing, you know, in a couple of years' time and saying, we did it? That would be very, very, you know, wow, powerful. So, and in healthcare, an example closer to changing things in mental health care, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme um, started out in acute settings and it started out wanting to reduce hospital deaths, you know, the number of people who died in hospital. It was, it was identified that were probably um, um, avoidable deaths and avoidable harm. Uh, and so through a, a variety of initiatives, I won't go into the detail of it, a bold aim was achieved 
fewer people died, lives were saved. Professor Jason Leach, he was a very enigmatic guy, a good speaker. He, uh, I heard him speak and, and that made me think, I would quite a bit of that. I'd like to get involved in this, it really sounds exciting and meaningful and, and it works. So, the, and the Scottish Government believed that too. So six years ago, the Scottish Government said, well, we'll expand this uh, programme of work. Uh, I won't go into the detail of this, but this describes the overall programmes which, which are then introduced. So beyond acute hospitals, programmes for primary care, um, for obstetrics and child health, and for mental health were introduced um, with a, a, a theme, really, that a safety approach, which is part of quality improvement, you can argue it's not, it's, in, it's, it's inseparable from quality improvement, focuses on reducing harm. And in order to reduce harm, you identify when things are going wrong, so hence the deteriorating patient sort of idea. And the specific harms that we, that we focused upon were around violence, um, self-harm, and associated is seclusion and or restraint um, a harm or is it, is it something that happens? Well, we spoke to or we asked people and they said it was a harm. It was horrible. It was not pleasant either to be the staff member having to restrain or seclude someone or indeed to be on the receiving end of that. So clearly there are harms. I'll, I'll mention the fact, of course, the seclusion in Scotland only happens in one hospital. If every other, there are 14 regional health boards or islands which don't have beds generally. Um, but the psychiatric units across Scotland don't have seclusion rooms. They do restrain people, they do give them drugs. Violence occurs, we still have to deal with people who are uh, full of synthetic you know, materials that make them really, really ill. Um, but we traditionally just didn't do seclusion, apart from in the, what is the state special hospital where it's done very, very, in a very limited way. So yeah, that, that, yeah. it's an interesting point to put across to you. If we had it, I expect we would use it. You know, if we had the rooms, you know, we probably, probably would be using them. But we, the culture just was that we just didn't build them. And I know that there are new builds happening in Auckland area and elsewhere. Maybe you should just not build the rooms. But, uh, anyway. Um, so yeah, I, that, so yeah, that just illustrates the, the programmes and the, and the mental health programme, which I got involved in six years ago, um, is one of them. So beyond those physical harms, though, when we spoke to or, or asked people who are receiving services, well, over and above feel, feeling physically harmed, i.e. self-harm or violence, there's things, you know, because actually seclusion may not necessarily involve, I guess it involves a bit of hands-on, but the psychological effect of it, I guess, is what people are telling us. Other things that we were, were quickly pointed towards was also the whole business, and I know there's separate work going, on around, going around connecting care and transitions, the process of how people get into hospital. You know, a, a, a story I was told was, of someone who'd been discharged, went home, and their neighbour said, oh, it must have been awful upsetting when the police came and had to take you away. But, you know, we know, we know you weren't well. You know, the sort of social stigma that that generated for that person was, you know, still with them. So, uh, and the sexual harm issue, again, I've, I've visited one or two facilities where obviously there are mixed sex, um, and, you know, it's... Uh, and the... the I'm not talking about sexual assault here, but people feeling uncomfortable, people who perhaps have been traumatised previously, feeling that they can't actually go into the day room because, they, because it's, there are men there who don't know, they feel intimidated by their behaviour. So, so gender-related issues, I suppose, is what I'm talking about. So, yeah, so, so it's our, our focus and our starting point, much like yours, was to ask people, what are the things that we should be focusing on? What are, what are the priorities in this work? And it was based around these various harms. So that led us to, to our, our, our work streams. Now, when you read these, um, I hope you'll see that actually they're quite similar to the areas of work over and above seclusion work that, that the, uh, uh, the improvement work is going to be doing or focusing on here in New Zealand. So again, you, you, you generated yours in a similar way, asking people uh, what, where should we start. And in Scotland, hey presto, the same things came up. So again, the, the, the kind of issues and the areas where things go wrong, whether it's in people getting the wrong medicine or people who are medication errors or whether it's around how people are risk, are risk managed or when, when things go wrong, it's often about communication failures, 
um, and obviously we've talked about the, the issue of violence, restraint and how we might reduce that. These are common to uh, Scotland and here. And I guess the other thing that's common is that the kind of elements of what we want to achieve in terms of improving things are exactly the same. So uh, we have done a, a lot of work in our program around rights-based care. And I know the issue of equity is something which uh, has been mentioned a lot and I think you're very, very conscious of. Um, but we were, we, were, we were forced to reflect on yeah, how, the, how, how people's human rights are or may not be um, valued or considered. And of course, seclusion is regarded internationally as a violation of human rights. So, so there's kind of powerful voices about, about why it is something to really address. Um, Person-centred, again, we, we talk about that in the basis that uh, uh, interventions shouldn't just be, this is what we always do to someone who's being admitted. It should be because this is what you need. So again, examples of, oh, well, we always seclude someone, or we always put someone on a one-to-one -one OBS in this particular unit when they come in. You know, you can't, you, we, we would challenge that and say, well, it should be based on what that person needs. Co-design, I think, is something that you're probably better at than we are. Um, we, we looked at some elements of what we've done in our program, and co-design, um, and we've got some proper academics to look at it and said, well, that was almost co-design, almost proper co-design, but it wasn't quite. So, um, so we are, I, would, I think I'm, I'm learning, I think, from you guys about how to do that better. Um, so, and, and obviously the whole issue of trying to prove safety as part of quality, you know, we're not working in, a, in the absence of issues around money, resources, things have to be done effectively and efficiently as well. So, so those are the kind of context of, of the work that we were doing. So, so, and as you are discovering, um, this is all straightforward, isn't it? This is, uh, is, is going to be easy. Um, and as you hear about um, some of this elements, PDSA, as Clive said, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, but driver diagrams and all that stuff. We, I'm not an expert in improvement science. I've picked up a bit over the years. And the, the only way I've picked up on it is keeping it simple. And it can be very, very simple and straightforward, I would say. And I hope you'll see that over, over the weeks. And I know that many of you will be already picking up a lot around it. So I, I would just say, we maybe made the mistake, and again, this is where do's and don'ts, we maybe made the mistake of overcomplicating things at the beginning, um, as opposed to em emphasizing the important bit about getting together, understanding the problems, and thinking about possible solutions. And then people can help with the science of testing and implementing. So don't make it too complicated. And PDSA, as you know, is, uh, is something that's a very important part of the, of the whole improvement science. And I guess we were, we were very keen that people, because I suppose on the, on the serious note, people were put off sometimes by, oh, we need, I, need, I can't possibly get involved in this stuff, I don't know enough about it. Just have a go, have a go, on you go, is the important message. Complicated slide, but again, it just reflects what, uh, where I think you guys are, you know, that, that there's something about improvement science, as you are discovering, I hope, which is really quite exciting because you see things change quickly. But you do need to, uh, and I mean, David may agree from his experience, that you do need to spend a bit of time preparing the ground. Um, events like this are very important so that people have a shared understanding of what it's all about. Uh, but you don't want to wait for the perfect package of things before you even test anything. You know, the, the, the days of, uh, you know, sitting around a committee table for months and months, coming up with a perfect solution, launching it, and then realizing it doesn't really work, I think uh, hopefully are, are largely gone. And I would agree that we wouldn't attempt any kind of improvement in our services without considering it in a, without testing it first, without taking a quality improvement approach, because um, we believe it works. And resources, uh, again, David, uh, 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 answered this question for me, that uh, people will always say they're far too busy, there's not enough resource, that, you know, we're, 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 we're in a state of panic here, we're down the cardboard. Um, this is not going to be a good outcome. But, uh, and I would, I would say that, yes, if, if, you're a, if you're in a situation where you really have absolutely no, no resource whatsoever, it's very hard to get people to consider spending time reflecting on how they do things, trying to improve them, getting rid of that square wheel and giving, giving yourself a round one, etc. Um, but I, I guess you're probably where I think we are. So, you know, you're, you're at the area where you know, there's not an abundance of resource, but there's not, neither is there none. 
Uh, so, and you know that, that that's a slight lack of resource but promotes creativity. It's you know it's, it is true I think actually that when, when, when the chips are down and you've, you need to think a bit differently, you know, you're forced to. And the result is that things can be actually be more efficient. It can save money. Um, our friends in East London describe how they made some time for this kind of work by stopping doing things that were a bit of a waste of time, like big, large-scale audits that sat on a shelf. You know, they've moved moved to doing it all through QI. In Scotland, we went to wards and asked them about the things that were problems in their ward, and recommended well try something a very, very small change that wouldn't take any much time, and those often led to efficiency. I'll give you an example in a second. So. So, oops. so guiding principles. Um, I'll come on to the, the, the what, what uh, Clive was alluding to later. You know, in a few years' time, you're, you're hoping to have a whole range of, uh, or maybe even sooner than that, a whole range of ideas which have been tested and worked out, and you've you've worked, you've identified that they are effective in reducing seclusion and other restrictive measures. You know, you could, I could give you our list of things. There you go. Well, you go home, do that, and it's all sorted. But what we discovered was that there's nothing more powerful than generating your own evidence for what works. A bit like cognitive behavioural therapy versus antidepressants. You know, CBT gives you a bit of power about, oh, I, I can challenge my negative thinking and avoid my uh, anxiety and depression, um, whereas I'm just a passive recipient of a pill. So you guys are not the passive recipient of pearls of wisdom. Have sweeties, by all means, but you're not the passive recipients of pearls of wisdom. You're being given the tools to generate your own ideas, to implement them, and to see that they work. And as soon as you start seeing that they work, and I know that some people are starting to see promising signs, wow, that's, that's the real powerful part of QI methodology, quality improvement. That's why it's better, I think, because it gives the, the power and the resource to everybody. Um, and and, and to, in order to do that, it's been alluded to, and I, I don't know, in our discussion about um, in the icebreaker about trust and you know feeling giving people um you're trusting people to try things as a manager as a director of a service you know people doing things different and might do it wrong oh my goodness me it involves building confidence within certain parameters that people uh, people's ideas are worth following up on and again david did it very well and transparency being open and honest not hiding mistakes because as we've already heard, and as I'll reiterate, learning from when things go wrong is a very important part of this whole process. And again, you'll hear more about the need to measure, um, because indeed, if you don't measure and you don't, in, 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 you, can, you can do some elements of quality improvement without measuring, but then you, then you don't know why, why you did it, whether it really worked or not, what the, what the actual important elements were. So, so that's where the science comes in, if you like. So. Um, yeah, and sponsors, management structures. The first duty of managers is not to get in the way. You know, to be supportive is great, but don't be a barrier. And sometimes you come across people with barriers. We were at a, 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 an event in the north of Scotland, and uh, we, at the end of it, we'd, we'd talk through about change ideas and helping people with dementia. Um, and a staff nurse stood up and said, I, next week I want to do this. I want to, I want to change our process just try it out in a different way. And I could see her manager looking a bit grey and going, uh, yeah, uh, that's great, but I'll have to put it through the governance committee. And uh, you know, maybe a week or two before we can actually think about that. And I, so she gets it, but you don't, was my feeling. But so, so managers don't get in the way. Pace of change. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You have an ambitious um, sort of a time, time scale ahead of you. Whether you meet that, I think it's good to be ambitious, uh, but I think it's also important to, to, to ensure that things are done in a way that they can be sustained and consolidated, and that there's a bit of flexibility not only in, in how the programme is planned and how the work is done in the ground in the, at the coal face, but there's a bit of flexibility in thinking about, you know, yeah, are, we, are we at a stage where we do want to proceed at this pace and introduce the next uh, area of work, etc. So I think using QI thinking and accepting what the feedback from the frontline teams as you do this work, I'm not saying you have to slow down, it might be that you actually want to, want to speed up, but I think be conscious of what is the best uh, uh, speed. And different places will, will be at different stages, and I think that's fine. 
Because as soon as you have variation, you can learn from somebody else. You know, that's, the, that's the beauty of a collaborative model, to be honest. And I guess the, uh, there, is, there is the need to have people who know more about this stuff. And you've got a, a lot of people trained and you know, you've got improvement advisors, proper experts. But a little bit of training in a ward or at the bedside about what a PDSE is from you guys who will know much more about it, certainly by the end of today, and probably know more about it already. Um, you know, there's a cascading effect of the ideas, because I, I genuinely think it's a, it's a fairly simple concept once you get your head around it. And the whole thing about mistakes, um, you can learn a lot from mistakes. And this, this was, Cliff was a, was a psychiatrist who, who said this at one of the meetings. I thought, I'll, I'll take a note of that. Um, so uh, the, the key element of, well, I've already mentioned the need for transparency, from, from understanding what, what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and that, 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 that means that's also true at larger scale. So the whole business, we have a, a work stream around leadership and culture and uh, about the need for, um, the need for transparency, openness, and a safety culture when it comes to addressing potentially very serious events. Um, now, this is this is about the list that I'm not going to give you, um, because we we started out with uh, um, five six years ago, in exactly the same way that you're doing, and when you develop work streams. We introduced them slightly different from the way you're proposing to do so, but we introduced those work streams, saw work around the country in all those areas, came together in, in meetings like this went away and did actions. And from that, we ended up with something like, well, 25 areas of work, for each, five or six for each, of the, for each of the work streams, which we had a bit of evidence that they were important. So for instance, and I'll give you an example in a second, um, a safety huddle, you know, places where they started to do that, improve communication, reduce um, harmful events, uh, you know, it's worked in, in many very positive ways. So the 25 things were generated from the teams. We, we in, a, in our attempt to consolidate work in inpatients as we move towards more patient safety work in other parts of the service and, you know, in the, in the community, um, was that was our, our sort of output, if you like. I'd say at the beginning, me and some really clever blokes could have come up with a list that looked quite like it and given it to people, but it wouldn't have had anything like the same effect. This, the generating of your own ideas and seeing them have an effect is, is what's important. So yeah, safety huddle. Um, and the reason I've said huddle, not cuddle, because we were at a meeting, I could see some one person looking very sort of aghast and said, it's, it's, you, you talk about you come together and cuddle. I said, no, 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 it's not, it's not as nice as a cuddle. It's a, it's a meeting where you, where you come together, you, have it, you stand up, you share what's going on in the ward that day. We introduced it to, or one hospital introduced it to wards based on the idea that surgeons do. You have a sort of quick meeting to discuss the key issues before they then go and do their surgery. Um, they found it so helpful, they thought, well, let's do a hospital-wide huddle. So this is a hospital-wide huddle at Mid Park Hospital in Dumfries, and it takes 12 minutes on average. All the risks around the hospital are shared very briefly. It generates an email, so in my pocket, my phone, or so there, I, I know how many beds there are in the hospital, what the major risk issues are. They've generated a summary of what's going on. It's reduced adverse incidents. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's improved, clearly improved communication. It's also saved money. Uh, how? Because I, I assumed that nurses and nurse, charge nurses, and includes doctors and all, all staff, but I assumed that wards would share information about staffing. But it, it didn't happen before. So now, but now they do, and now instead of getting bank nurses in, they're able to share staffing. So it's reduced <coughs> bank costs by as a as an unexpected benefit. So, just an example. Another, another example that we are very proud of, but again, I'm very conscious that your co-design and your collaboration with all the people involved in this um, from different communities and uh, our, our consumers as well as providers is, is, is ahead of us almost. But we were, we were struck at the beginning that counting stuff is one way of identifying change or improvement, but you also need to understand what people feel. There's a, there's a qualitative aspect. Uh, and when it came to trying to work that out, so we had lots of big, serious meetings, and then Gordon Johnson, who was uh, from Voice of Experience, who Sean you know, was very involved in, or John started it, um, as a, as a, the Conservative user, um, organization in Scotland, said, well, tell you what, maybe the best way to find out whether things are getting better or not is to ask people. So 
we came up with a fancy tool to ask people. Well, it's a, a bit more than a bit more than asking them, but yeah. Others exist, but the Patient Safety Climate Tool for Staff and Patients, which gives you a cross-sectional view of how safe a place feels and whether people feel they can put their hand up and say, I don't think that should be happening, etc. Uh, it's something that we've used over very many, something like 6,000 staff members, something like 800 patients have gone through the process, and it's given us hugely rich information uh, to then inform where the work should be focused. So again, that, that need to, yes, look at the numbers, but also use, you know, patient's experience, people's experience of the, of the service as a, as a key factor. Um, and again, just to, just to, suppose to say that, you know, that when I say that every, everyone who's in the, in the ward, I mean everyone. So actually it's a supported tool where someone who's even very ill can, can be encouraged to sort of express what's going on for them. So. so the word clout Improving safety is about giving people. Um, I mean, it's, it's clout. Clout's a word in New Zealand, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't just mean a clout in the air. It does. It means about giving people leverage and power and sharing what is normally held up up here, you know, and with everyone. And I do think that quality improvement initiatives and a collaborative process like the one that you have here, you know, shares out the clout in a way which is respectful and trusting. And comes with it, it comes with a bit of responsibility for everyone. So if you're being given the chance to have a, a say, then say it. You know, so you know, use your clout that you're being given productively. Um, I would say. So almost, yeah. Sorry to keep you from coffee, but yeah, cultural change takes a bit of time. Uh, but it's, it is possible. In Scotland, we have gone from a, a, a data-free zone in terms of wards to one where you walk in, there's charts on the wall, people are quite excited about making changes, they've seen evidence of things getting better for themselves. It goes up and down, it's not, uni it's not universal, but the, you know, the, the biggest changes in the culture within the, the services, I would say. And is it right to have a zero seclusion aim? I think it is, yes, because aim high and you'll, you might even get there. So anyway, that's all good to say. Thank you very much.